Boa tarde, pessoal. Sejam todos bem-vindos a mais uma apresentação da Education USA, a sua fonte oficial de informações sobre ensino superior nos Estados Unidos. Meu nome é Fernanda, eu sou advisor da Education USA aqui na PUC-Rio e também coordeno o programa Oportunidades Acadêmicas Graduate e Ponte de Talentos. Eu estou aqui hoje com o Georgetown University, Macaud School of Public Policy. Eu tenho aqui Trish Makovsky, que é diretora assistente de admissions, e também a Andrea Barcelos, que é uma mestranda do primeiro ano. Que... Oh, you're muted. <risos> Fernanda, isso. A apresentação vai ser toda em em inglês, mas vocês podem não, achar, não se sentirem confortáveis, podem escrever suas perguntas no chat e eu ajudo vocês, mas por favor não deixem de fazer suas perguntas, tá bom? É, e eu espero que tenham todos uma ótima apresentação. Trish, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and thank you everyone for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, and we wanted to especially thank our partners at Education USA for helping coordinate this session. Uh, we have a lot of great Latina, uh, Latinx students uh, at McCord and uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so my name is Trish Makovsky and I'm the Assistant Director of Admission at the McCord School of Public Policy with Georgetown University. Um, we have a current student, uh, Andrea, who is in the second semester of the Master of Policy Management program. Um, so she has a unique perspective as someone who is going through the program during the times of COVID. Um, so she will be an excellent resource for you. Um, so overall, we will be talking about Georgetown programs, but really we want to also focus on uh, just discussing graduate applications in the United States um, and studying abroad uh, in the U.S. for graduate school. Uh, so, Andrea, can you please introduce yourself, uh, tell the participants where you're from, what your academic background is, um, what led you to decide to study in the U.S. and, and at McCourt? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Andrea Barcelos. Um, I am originally from the countryside of Brazil uh, in Paraná. Um, I did my undergrad in international relations in Curitiba, which is the capital of Paraná for Trish, so she knows. <laughs> and um, then I moved to the US for my first master's degree. This is my actually my second one. Um, my first master's was also international relations, and then I moved abroad. I worked in a lot of places, including I moved back to Brazil, worked in Brazil for a while. Um, I started focusing more and more in Latin America. And then last year, I came back to the US and I decided I wanted to not only study about the issues we have in the world, but also, but also how to implement policies that can change and impact them. So that's when uh, Georgetown, you are in DC, you are where decisions are being made, where power is. So I thought it would be a perfect place to start. So I actually contacted my court um, last year when I was applying to see the requirements and all of that and see how to make a competitive application. Um, uh, they were super accessible, they were super nice and I, they, basically convinced me it was, I was making the right decision. Um, so I applied last year and it started on summer. I am doing part-time uh, because I work full-time. So it's a part-time, um, I'm doing it part-time just so you know. But um, it's been a very different experience starting online, everything online, but I'm actually surprised in a good way of how things are going. So uh, I just, a few things to keep in mind besides um, the name Georgetown, McCourt is a great school. Uh, people are very accessible. I think that's very relevant. Uh, and number two, they have a lot of groups, um, organizations for students, which I think is also something that makes a difference uh, when you're going to grad school. So I think that's my main introduction. Thank you so much. Um, and you mentioned this, this program in particular begins over the summer um, and it takes week-long and two two as a part-time student week-long intensive courses can you talk more about how it's how you've been adapting to a virtual classroom environment and 
what may be uh, the advantages or disadvantages of studying in this way during this time? So I end up not doing the required course ah. over the summer, <laughs> but I started over the summer. Um, and what I can say is that I was very anxious. So I actually talked about deferring for a year, starting next year. I had a lot of conversations with different people in Georgetown to make my decision. I'm a court. Uh, and I decided to go and start this year. And I don't regret it. I think we definitely miss the peer involvement of being like with people. But that is just the beginning. I'm now, I've met in person some students. I've met through Zoom way too many people. Um, <laughs> so like, I feel that everyone adapted. And also there is a very good side of it. For example, uh, some sections are recorded. So you can go back and for what you don't understand and go back and actually check it. Or for example, I'm taking a con now, which for me, it's very hard. So it gives me the option of like seeing the lecture twice if I have to, or it gives you more time to understand. Um, I also think if, uh, the professors are, everyone is adapting and the professors are making a good job to make themselves available through email, through Zoom meetings, weekends. So I honestly was anxious at first and now if I'm, it's, I'm just seeing positive sides of it. Of course, I want to go to campus and see campus. That's obvious, but uh, you don't miss information. I think you actually gain more information from it. Okay, thank you. Um, and you've lived in DC now for a while. So talk more about the, the DC location and why that's important for public policy. Uh, this is a great city. It's very hard at first, but it's a great city for networking. Everyone here is somehow connected. We also say you're one person away from where you wanna be. Um, because if you don't know someone, for example, if you wanna work in the World Bank um, and you, you don't know someone who works there, someone from your group will know someone who does or your academic advisor will. And then I think that is the beauty of DC is it's a small town in a way. Uh, everyone knows each other. Everyone here has similar goals. It's very unusual when you find someone who works, I don't know, like that's a dentist, for example. Most people here work in international relations, public affairs, um, policy, all, all of this kind of like positions. So it's very good for you if you want to build this network of people and having um, like having people where you want to work. So I think that's very important. Second, DC is a fun city. Everyone says it's boring, I disagree. Happy hours here are huge. So 6 p.m. bars are filled with people. So yes, you might not have the beach like you have in Rio, but you have amazing, beautiful things like the mall, Northeast, rooftops. So I think as Brazilians, we also tend to go, oh, it's like, we have this like party side of us and here I think it's very very good in that regard as well um, and it's a very clean safe city I just love to live here you can be anywhere in 10-15 minutes and yeah <laughs> very walkable yeah definitely um, and can you comp compare studying uh, in Brazil versus studying in the U.S. what are some big differences that you've found yeah, that it's, um, I'm going to talk more about my first master's because that's where I faced most of my challenges. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, the transition for me, at least, was very, very hard. I was just 21, 22 when I started my other master's um, straight out of college. First of all, writing in a second language, academically speaking, it's, it's a whole new world. I'm not talking about being fluent in a language. I'm talking about writing well in that language. That for me, the first semester was very, very hard. Uh, and I had to go to academic resources and I know Georgetown has them to help me because you have to change the way you write. Second, all the options you have. Like you have student organizations of all sorts. You have connections and professors from all, all sorts. Um, professors are accessible in a way that they are not in Brazil, at least from my experience. They have office hours that I 
they are actually there and they are actually working with you. They want you to like make a research, publish. They want you to succeed. They are willing to go the extra mile to connect to you with people. So for me, that was one another big difference. The third thing is how fast it is. Uh, in Brazil, our from the day you start until you have midterms, you have more time to prep. You have more time to realize what's going on, get in. Here is now, like I basically started, I feel like two weeks ago and I have midterms next week. So like everything, because you have summer, that's a long summer, fall and spring are very compact and very fast and you have to go with that. So it's not like it's first week of class, there's nothing. First week of class, you're already doing readings and writing and talking and you have to know where Canvas is, where all the information is. So I think those are the, the main differences I noticed. Those are, yeah, those are definitely could be challenges for a lot of students, so thank you. Um, what would you say you've enjoyed the most about studying in the U.S. despite all of those uh, hurdles? Um, you learn a lot. I think that every class I have, um, like for example, summer was a compact class in two weeks and I've learned a lot. So I think the most, um, like I think, I, I you have to learn how to not be shy and ask for help. You have to learn that you, you have an accent and it doesn't matter, you're gonna have this accent forever. So you gotta speak up and you, you don't have to be shy about it. Um, so I think you're always challenging yourself in ways that you don't have to challenge yourself in, in Portuguese or in Brazil. Uh, reading might take longer at first, but then you get used to it. You're speaking in like, it's normal to have problems with the accent that people are like, oh wait, what exactly do you mean by this? So once you realize that is not a weakness, but actually a strength that you have, that it's like, it's, it's, it's a matter, it, it shows that you speak an, another two, three languages, then I think you can come up with them and be like, okay, this is it. So I think it forces you out of your comfort zone very fast and you learn and you grow and opens for new opportunities. Great. Do you have a favorite professor or a class that you've taken so far? I'm not long enough there to <laughs> okay. say, but I had a Dr. Ofori last, uh, uh, over the summer and he was incredible. Like I think um, because I had my questions at first about online teaching, online coursing, like being actually doing it online. And he was amazing, like talking to me office hours, he spent like an hour every Friday, like going over things that are not even related to work uh, of the academic thing, but like, just like to give me a sense of Georgetown. So I'm very grateful for him. <laughs> okay, great. And you mentioned being uh, involved in student organizations. Can you talk more about that generally, about the, the student orgs that are at McCourt um, and any specifically that you're involved with? Sure. So I am the head of communications now for the migration uh, initiative that they have, which is a new, brand new organization. Um, and migration is my, from everything, from migration is my passion. It's the thing I have worked the most. So when I heard about it, I was super excited. So if that's something new that's forming now, so I think it opens for new opportunities. LAPA is the Latin America uh, Latin America, I don't remember the rest. Latin America Organization. Policy all, Association, I think. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'm also involved with them. Um, so I think I've worked mostly in Latin America for the past few years. So I thought it made sense for me to get there. And they are, we are having Michelle Bachelet next uh, in, at some point in this year, I think November. So like they are very involved in bringing people, bringing speakers. So um, it's a very, it's very nice. Um, and also I'm also involved indirectly, not as much in the women in policy, in public policy organization, Wiki, that I think I, gender inclusion and gender everything, it's very important right now. Um, and they also have very interesting uh, things and also there's a civil um, military organization that I am aware of. I don't know how much about them. Um, because I'm not involved, but I, these three other organizations I'm more familiar with, I really, really think it's very, 
It's a great tool to participate in events, meeting people, uh, making friends, because I feel this is the easiest way to make friends. Like I'm actually meeting a lot of them tomorrow. So it's like, it's, it's another good resource for help, assistance, and all of that. Um, what, what do you want to do after you finish the program when you leave, leave McCourt? And how do you think your experience at McCourt will help you achieve your career goals? So the reason I joined is because I, I did policy work in Brazil and I want to bring that to a, a more broad global level. Uh, with that being said, I want, I think migration policy is something that people do not have extensive knowledge about it. There is a lot of understanding and concepts and bias, but not deep knowledge. Uh, I studied it a lot and I have experiences on it. So I hope that I can get these experiences implement in the policy, how to do it, how can we change things, how can we implement, how can we bring awareness to people about the real issues and how to fix them. And I am hoping that my court is going to give me uh, these tools that I'm missing right now, that I feel like I'm missing right now to actually do this. Um, so that's more or less my plan. Yeah. And is there anything else that you haven't already touched on um, about being an international student in DC, in the court that you would like to share to, to the participants? Um, it's not easy. I think that's something you have to keep in mind. Uh, people who say that, oh, everything is beautiful and amazing, they either grew up somewhere else or you have to figure it out the visa, which is a pain. Uh, you have to figure out what you can do, what you cannot do. You have to figure out how to pay for it, uh, how to survive in DC, because this is a very, very expensive city. Um, so there is a lot of, and now the dollar is like, it's, it's insanely high. So like all these things you gotta consider, um, if you can actually do it and find ways to do it. Uh, which I think is the hardest part. Um, so I highly recommend go after scholarships, look for what's out there, look for positions in Georgetown and McCord that can help you to live in DC because I think that is a very complicated part. Um, studying here is very expensive. Um, so keep that in mind because you need to have a plan. Um, you cannot just do it. Um, and second, I think what I want to say, like, it's, I said this before, but not, don't be shy. I think you gotta, you're gonna get out of your comfort zone and be like, you have to do it and you have to talk to people and you have to go to events and you're going to be going to a whole bunch of events in town because they have, they are offering all of those and like think tanks and all of that, those talk to people, meet people, be nice. And not as a networking because this person can help me somewhere, but understand that there, understand what other people are coming from because you can change your mind. You can change your perspectives uh, on the way. So I think it's always important to keep an open mind for what you are bringing and what you are getting out. And can you talk more about, uh, the the people who are in your program what what kinds of backgrounds do they have are there other um, brazilians or latin american students uh, tell us about um, the makeup so i know there is a lot of latinos uh i've been in touch with a few but it's mostly americans i would say in my program um i haven't met any brazilians yet i'm still looking uh i know in my court yes there are other brazilians but in my program i haven't found another one yet um I haven't seen many Asians yet. Um, and so, yes, I, I, I'm just started, but people in my program tend to be older uh, because it's a requirement for the program and they tend to be very, with amazing experiences, like amazing experiences, uh, years of years of working places, lawyers, people with other master's degree. So like the level of the discussions is always high. So you always need to be prepared and you always, you need to be up to date with everything going on. Like, so otherwise you're gonna get behind uh, on the jokes, on the conversations. So 
I feel I like the challenge. I, I like being challenged all the time and that's what happens. So, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll just mention to the participants that we have four different master's programs. The one Andrea is in is our mid-career professional program, um, but not all of them require work experience. In fact, uh, two out of the four do not require any work experience. Uh, and those students tend to be a little bit younger, uh, just maybe a, a couple of years of work experience, if any. Um, um, if I, sorry to yeah, interrupt, yeah. but yes, um, that's the, I, I got that when I started joining the organizations. Uh, you see that there are a lot of people straight out of college. So they have started their masters. So if you're just, if you're just out of college, just focus on the programs that are for that. Like I have more experience, so I wanted something different. That's why I end up going like uh, to this program. But yes, don't, it's not a problem. I didn't mean, yeah. I didn't mean to be a, make it as no. a problem. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to clarify that, uh, that there are uh, lots of students from, from different backgrounds, different ages, different uh, countries that, that they uh, originate from. Um, different majors even. Um, so we can talk more about that later. But uh, I think my last question, Andrea, is, is for, for the participants today, they're just learning about, um, or I guess gathering information about studying in the US, the application process. What's one piece of advice that you would give um, to really help them either decide what kind of program to look for, any application tips, um, things like that. Okay, for the program, let me take notes, I was gonna forget. Program, I think for the program, you gotta look what you are good at and what you're not good at. Um, because I think you want to enhance what you're good at, but you also need to learn what you're not good at so you can sell yourself in that regard. Or big, like, I'm not good at it, but I've learned and I studied, so I now have like experience in it. Um, I also think you should consider professors uh, that you want to work with if they are aligned with what you want to do. And nowadays, for the you got to think in the job market. Uh, what is a transferable skill? What can you learn that can be useful for an employee that are a place you want to work? For example, you need another language. You need to speak Spanish. You need to speak Arabic. Um, you need to learn how to code in R. You need to like what you need to learn um, and what you are good at. I think you have to look for classes that are going to make you think even more about it and explore new ideas, explore new options and increase it. Um, I also think you got to look for where you want to work because you got to study where you're going to want to work. So if you want to work in New York, I think you should reconsider. But if you wanna work in something that BC can help you and the organization see your branches here, I think you gotta, you gotta consider that. Uh, as for the application, well, the application said it was a challenge for me. Um, the statement, the statement of, a statement of purpose. Statement of purpose. Yes, there we go. Um, it's 500 words. Like how can you say what you wanna do and why you're good in 500 words? So like I drafted that thing, I think like a hundred times because I started in like three pages. So what I would say is you got to show your why you, you are relevant for Georgetown as well. Like what can you bring to the table? Uh, but also be like why you want to do this. Because if you want to be like, yeah, whatever. No, like you got to know why you want to do this and you have to have a clear image in your mind why you want to have it and why you want to do it so you can put in 500 words um i also think that it's important to bring and that's my opinion so i i'm not in, in admissions by any means uh something personal about it because i imagine they receive hundreds of them so it's like if you get some like a template and be like first sentence second no, you gotta have like a personal why or a personal something, um, but like why you're different, why you are a good person should be in this program. I think it's also relevant, and yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah, it's your it's your opportunity to tell your story and get allow us to get to know uh, you on another, a different level. Another point that I asked, I think it might have been Trish. I don't remember. Um, so one of my recommendation letters, the person that was writing was very scared because they don't, didn't know English. 
and they told me they translated someone translated and blah 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 and they were pretty afraid of the english being bad which probably was uh and i asked if that would be a problem and they said no because uh, they are used to have foreigners sending uh, recommendation letters so i think that's do not don't ask someone because they don't speak english ask them and they're going to figure out how to write it uh, and they are going to figure out how to understand what's there. <laughs> so I think Georgetown is also like, they are used to have international students. Plus TOEFL, you got to have a, more than a hundred. I think that's the standard. Um, so prep for it. And what else? Yes, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and are there questions? I think there's some from the chat. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay, so one question about um, students being straight from high school, 17, 18. So no, um, all of the programs, at least that we're talking about today, are graduate programs. So you have to go through your bachelor's degree. Um, there are some students that come directly out of your undergraduate degree, but usually that's around early 20s. Um, but our, our age range ranges from early 20s to you know, mid 30s or higher, depending on your experience um, and, and at where you are in your career. Um, let's see. Um, um, political, go ahead. Trish, oh, yeah. uh, uh, sure. would you like uh, them to open the mic and ask? Uh, how would sure. you do that? What, how yeah, do you Whatever is pre uh, preferred for, for the student, uh, Andrea said she's happy to speak Portuguese as well and take questions in Portuguese. So whatever is best for, for you all. Mm -hmm. You were still going to talk about applications, right? Yep, yep, and I'll talk about that. Um, uh, but, but if students have specific questions for Andrea before she has to go, um, we can- I, I got a, a question uh, here about, doing an inter exchange program during high school. Um, I think I'm not the right person to answer. Uh, it was just written in Portuguese. So Trish, do you think that um, having an exchange program to the US during high school or no? Yes, makes it easier or better to get into a university here? Um, so, so I, I mostly work with students who are um, are going to be graduate students. Um, I think in general, if you have any academic experience within the U.S., um, that may make you stand out to the admissions process. But probably the, the biggest advantage would be to you just to get some exposure about how classes are taught in the US. Um, you know, like, like Andrea said, reading and writing academically in English is, is more challenging. So if you have more experience in that, um, what kind of, of lectures and, and discussions are, are in a United States classroom, whether it's high school or college uh, or graduate school, that can be helpful. Uh, it can give you perspective first-hand perspective on, on what it's like to study in the U.S., um, which can be an advantage to a, an undergraduate application or even a graduate application um, because you know what it's like to be in a, an American classroom. Thank you. Uh, my suggestion is we go to the application process and then if we have sure. time in the end, we go back to can I, questions. Can I ask, can I ask something? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you, it's good to write something personal in your statement of purpose. And I'm kind of unsure how I'm going to do that because I know it has to be professional and like academic. So I'd like to know if you, can speak a little bit more how to find this balance, you know, between writing something that is that looks professional and academic enough, but also personal. I think I didn't express. I will let Trish also say what what her thoughts are, but I think maybe I didn't express myself clear. I, what I think is you have to have something um, like personally different, 
like something, for example, why are you passionate about something? What led you to choose, I don't know, focus on climate change? Um, like the personal side, I think it has to be like, or an experience, for example, if you moved to, I don't know, Japan and you had an experience there that made you realize the importance of something. So I think describe this experience where, or something in your neighborhood or someone who motivated you or like these specific details about some personal experience uh, that leads you where you are. So you tied up your personal experience with why you're doing it in your professional experience and you do like a, this kind of personal things. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And I, I can talk more about that in, in the presentation, but yes, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so some things that we'll talk, be talking about today, um, the statement of purpose is the first thing that actually, um, and just some general, uh, some general tips and tricks about uh, applying to the United States. Um, so yeah, let's start with the statement of purpose. Um, sometimes this can be called a personal statement. Different universities have different wording for it. Um, so, so number one, go to every website and, and really read the application uh, requirements. Um, so some of these tips for the statement of purpose may seem pretty obvious, but you would be kind of surprised at, at what we uh, see. <laughs> So when we're talking about being specific, you want to be as clear as possible when you're describing why you want to attend that specific institution. Um, a lot of people will apply to multiple schools at once, uh, and it is tempting to reuse the same statement for, for multiple universities, but most of the time that's not going to be that helpful for you. Um, so really, make it clear why this particular university, you can say the name, the program, uh, do the research into the specific program uh, and, and use it with when you're creating your statement of purpose. You wanna answer the question. So some of the, um, so, some of the universities have a specific question that you have to address or a prompt that you can get started with. So research that, find out what, what they want to hear from from you about in the statement of purpose. Um, they can, a, a lot of these can be different and, and don't just assume that one statement of purpose is going to fit the needs for each of, each of the programs that you're applying to. Um, so when you're writing your statement, you need to think about the specific graduate program, what school you're applying for, uh, what you're asking, oh, sorry, what they're asking as far as, uh, you know, what they want to hear and tailor that specifically to your school. Um, as as uh, Andrea was talking about, this is you you do want to make it personalized to some extent. This is your your chance to to tell your story, to provide us with more insight about you, um, why you want to go to the McCourt School, why you want to study in DC, what skills you want to really enhance throughout th this program, but also we, we like to um, review applications to see you as a person, not just something on the piece of paper. So talking about any experiences that you've had in the past, which motivated you to go to graduate school, or you, uh, this sparked your interest in public policy, or even where you want to take your career uh, after you finish your, your graduate program. All of these things are personal to you. Um, so, so really, I would say be thoughtful when, when constructing your statement of purpose um, and take your time with that piece in particular. Um, as far as following the directions, as Andrea also mentioned, some have word uh, requirements like 500 words. Um, do follow those formatting requests. A lot of times, um, you don't have to be exact. You don't have to be 500 words on the dot. But if you're sending a statement that's double the, the size of what we had asked for, that will be noticed. Um, so even though it may be hard to cut things down and edit things down to the, the formatting requirements, do the best you can. Um, and there may also be some font size requirements, spacing requirements. 
but all of these things should be clearly laid out on the uh, admissions website of the school you're looking at. So for your resume, um, I'm not sure how, how different a typical Brazilian resume is than, than a US resume, um, but I'm sure you can go online and, and see examples uh, to see what kind of uh, organizations or US schools typically expect when they're looking at a resume. Um, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to add something here? Yeah. Um, it is pretty different. Um, and first of all, do not include pictures. People here do not like that. First of all, find a model a template online and follow it because that makes a huge difference. When I was trying to apply, it was like another thing. So take, take your time and take time to understand the, how the resumes here work and forget about the Brazilian side and do it in the American style. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, and I have seen plenty with pictures. It's not when we get uh, other, you know, US American resumes, we very rarely see that, or if ever, but we have seen that. And you're not gonna be marked off if, if you do include your picture, but it's not typical for, for the United States. Um, as far as the content of your resume, typically a US resume is in chronological order. So where you have worked most recently, and then you go backwards, um, your educational history, of course, any publications that you've had, or activities that you've been involved in. Um, those things are important to highlight. Um, if you don't have any work experience, then you can definitely still have a good resume. You can list any internships that you have or volunteer organizations that you've been a part of. Um, perhaps you were, for instance, a, the student body president. Uh, and even though that's not a job, that's a great example of leadership that you've had at your school. Um, maybe you have had some significant scholarships or awards. Those are all the, the kinds of things that you should emphasize on your resume. And all of those things can help you stand out to the admissions committee. So again, the best thing to, to do is go online and research how, how you would structure your resume based on what's typical in the US, as, as Andrea mentioned. So for test scores, um, I guess the place to start with test scores is, is finding out what test scores are required for a specific program um, and looking at the minimum requirements that, that, might, that you might have. So at the McCourt School, for instance, we don't have any minimum GRE requirements, but we do have a minimum TOEFL or IELTS score uh, requirement. So yeah, Andrea mentioned it's 100 uh, on the TOEFL. That is a minimum test score, so you should aim to, to be 100 or higher for the TOEFL. The GRE, we are more flexible. Um, we don't have any standard uh, cutoff scores for the GRE. Um, with the TOEFL, you know, the reason that we do have that requirement is that we want to make sure our students will be able to succeed academically. If you're struggling, you know, with our English, uh, with your English in the program, it's going to make it even more challenging to go through that program. So when you're preparing for the test that, that's required, make sure you allow enough time. You don't want to wait till the very last minute to schedule the test, um, to take the test, or even to send the official scores. Uh, it does take, I don't know, maybe up to 10 business days for an official score to be sent to the university, for instance. Um, I, I don't know how long uh, Andrea has, uh, scheduled um, or I guess prepared for the test, uh, like a GRE test. Although I know for her program, there was no standardized test required. I don't know if at your uh, previous school you did, um, but maybe about two, one to two months in advance to, to really study and prepare for that test. Um, go ahead. <laughs> I would say a little more. Oh yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> especially for not, two things, especially for not good in numbers, there's a math session. And two, uh, there's a lot of verbs uh, for us to learn. Mm -hmm. So take a little time, a little longer if you can. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and and you'll, you'll need to, of course, register for the, for the exam. Uh, and like I said, it takes a, a 
decent amount of time for, for your score report to be sent to uh, the admissions committee and, and to be added to your application. Most times the universities will require the official uh, score report, um, but occasionally some schools will accept an unofficial score report at least until they get the official one in. So you'll just have to check to see. Um, most policy schools in the US require students to take the GRE, um, but there are other graduate degrees that, that accept other types of, of tests. Um, the GRE is, stands for the general record exam. Uh, and like I said, that's a lot, a lot of graduate programs in the US take that test. So that's probably the, the most typical test that students are taking. Um, for those taking or considering business school, um, you would want to take the GMAT typically um, for law school, the LSAT, and medical school, the MCAT. So lots of acronyms there. Um, one tip could be to keep a spreadsheet for, so that when you're going through all of the graduate programs, um, you can kind of keep track of all of the school's requirements uh, in, in a nice organized way. Um, and the TOEFL and the IELTS, that's, that's the, the only two scores, English scores, uh, that, that we accept at McCourt. Um, I think they're the most common nationwide. Um, but some schools might accept Pearson's or Duolingo. So again, it's, it's really looking into the website to see what is accepted and what's not. Um, don't assume that one test will fit all of the different programs that you're applying for. So again, to emphasize, it's very important to be detail-oriented, um, to be organized when you're keeping track of, of things like what test scores are required, what minimums are required. You don't want something you know, that's in your control, like missing a required test to, to be the thing that keeps you from, from being admitted. Um, okay, letters of recommendation. Um, this is another really important piece of, of your uh, application because it's, it's another opportunity for us to really hear about you um, from, directly from someone that knows you very closely and, and has worked with you or, or taught you. Um, so each university, each program typically requires a specific amount, sometimes two, sometimes three. Uh, at the McCourt School, we require three uh, uh, letters of recommendation, but I used to work at a different school, we only required one. Um, so check in to see. Sometimes also uh, schools might be okay with you sending more than what is required. Um, so for, for my last, uh, my last job, we accepted, uh, we had a minimum of one, but we accepted more. At the McCourt School, we require three and we will not accept more than three. So you really have to narrow it down to the three people who, who are best able to speak about you. You want to also be respectful of the recommender's time. Um, you don't want you know, a day before the deadline to ask them to write this letter of recommendation for you. Um, some recommenders, especially at universities, are writing multiple recommendations for students. So make sure to, to give them enough time um, so that they're not feeling the time pressure to, to get it done. It's also, I think, helpful to talk uh, to your recommender about the specific program that you're applying for, what your goals are, so that they can um, be really specific in, in their letters of recommendation. So, for instance, someone could say, uh, Andrea is a great student and they did really well in my class. Um, but that doesn't really give us a, a good sense that the recommender knows you well um, is, and is excited to really, for you to undertake graduate school. So share your goals with your recommender, maybe even a copy of your resume, discuss with them what things you'd like them to emphasize or at least what the school says uh, as far as requirements. Uh, and that's, that's usually a good place to start. As far as who to choose, this really varies. So if you're coming straight out of an undergraduate program or another graduate program, it could be more appropriate to have some academic re resources. Um, because your school experience is, is very recent and relevant. But if you've been out of work for a few years, you might not be in touch with those professors uh, from your university anymore. So you might be 
um, more likely to ask someone from your professional life, like your boss or your supervisor. Um, so just think about where you are in your career and in your life and determine who knows you the best, uh, who is the best person to speak about your skill set, your potential as a graduate student, um, and, and really what you can bring to the program. You could also use people like a coach, a mentor, someone that you volunteer with. Um, those could be valuable perspectives to add as well. Um, and, and as Andrea mentioned, if, if you get a letter in, in a different language, then you, you could get it translated to English. But yes, it should be in English. OK, some general tips. Be aware of the basic requirements. Um, so some schools do have minimum work experience requirement. Uh, if you don't have that time out in the working world yet, you may not be eligible. Um, if, a, uh, if a school requires a minimum 100 on the TOEFL and you have an 85, then you haven't met that basic requirement. So take the test again, make sure you have that minimum before you go further into the application process. Um, be sure to understand the scholarship process as well. Uh, some schools might have an additional essay that you have to fill out, um, different forms that you have to write. Um, so, so make sure to, to really figure out what's, what, what is the scholarship process. At McCourt, um, we don't have any specific form that you need to fill out. There's no separate application for scholarship. As long as you complete your application by either of our first two deadlines, then, um, then you're automatically guaranteed to be considered for scholarship. And it's all based on merit, um, basically the strength of your application. Um, and deadlines. Deadlines are super important, of course. Um, and also, which time zone are the deadlines in? So if, if it's you know, going to cut off at midnight, the midnight on the east, east coast or eastern time, see what time zone it is. Sometimes deadlines are strict and sometimes they're not. So you can always check in with the admissions committee, the, the admissions office. Um, a lot of times, you know, we could have a, a 11.59 p.m. deadline and at midnight it, it becomes inactivated. So don't make a, a small error like that and that could take away your chances. Um, but a lot of schools are flexible with their deadlines. Um, but don't make the wrong uh, assumptions, so definitely check with, with the office. Um, some graduate programs have an interview process. If that's the case, then prepare as you would any job interview. Um, also have some questions prepared, because that would make you look engaged and interested, um, and like you've done your research. Um, typically, interviews are used to just learn more about you. It's not very, it shouldn't be as high pressure as, as maybe a big job interview. Um, but try not to be super scripted. It's better for, for an interview to be more conversational so that you can give them a sense of your personality, what kind of person you are, what you're interested in within the graduate school. Um, so it, this is another good opportunity to be very specific coming into the interview, knowing what you want to share about yourself and, and why you want to go to graduate school. Um, some supplemental information might also be uh, required, um, such as an essay, a portfolio, um, different writing samples perhaps, depending on the program. So that should all be laid out on the application requirements website as well. Um, and just, yeah, to emphasize, don't wait until the last minute. Um, these, these things, there's a lot of moving parts to the application. There's a lot of requirements. So, so make sure you're, you're prepared, you're organized, and, and you get everything done in a timely manner by the deadline. You want to proofread. Don't make a silly error. Um, I've seen more often than, than I'd like. <laughs> than, it's just surprising that some students write about another school in your application to Georgetown, to, your, to the McCourt School. That's a very obvious, silly error. Um, and that something like that is easily avoided if you proofread it or ask someone else to read it for you. Um, we do have a waitlist, and many schools have a waitlist for, for their graduate programs. 
um, this is, you know, if, if you have a strong application, um, but you're, the, the admissions committee is not ready to accept you yet, um, that, that you could be put on the wait list and potentially you could then be admitted further on uh, in the application cycle. If you are put on a wait list, be sure to express your interest. That's probably the most important thing if you're on the wait list. Um, don't just be totally silent if you are very interested. Uh, this can make a big difference because a lot of times the admissions committee will want to admit someone off the wait list who has been in touch with us, who we know would accept the offer if, that, if they're admitted. Um, so just be in, in good communication with us. Um, and lastly, talk, talk to us. If you're having a problem, don't hesitate to reach out. Andrea said she has asked some questions with admissions. I think, I hope that most admissions offices are, are very happy to answer those questions. There are no stupid questions. We get many kinds of questions, all different kinds. Um, don't, don't be nervous about that. Um, if there's like a technical issue that you're facing with your online application, if there's a delay in what, a material arriving to us, if there's an issue with your recommender, just a, any kind of questions, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. We want you to put your best application forward um, and we're here to help you do that. So that's all I have for the, the tips. Um, if we have specific questions, I can answer those. Otherwise, I can go on to um, specific information about McCork. Alguma pergunta geral, pessoal, sobre application? Senão ela pode passar para uma corte especificamente. Mas fiquem à vontade. I saw two questions. One is about the average of the GRE uh, on, um, on my court in general. And the other is if my court does interviews. Sure, great question. So, um, as I mentioned, we don't have any minimum GRE requirements, but our averages include a 160 on the verbal section, a 160 also on the uh, quantitative section, and um, a 4.2 average on the analytical writing section. Um, and McCourt generally does not do interviews, um, so, so there are, there are occasional, occasionally times where we'll just want to get some more information um, from people about their application before making a decision, but I would say that's Pretty, it's pretty atypical. That's not super common. Um, most of the time, probably 90% of the time, we can make a decision just based on the, the materials that you present to us. Oh, let me see. Am I missing any others? Um, at what age and career level do applicants apply to graduate school for, for the McCourt School? for example. Um, it really varies, um, not only on the program, but where you are in your career, at what point you decide you want to go to graduate school. In general, um, there are some students who come straight out of undergrad, they know they want to get their master's degree, and, and then they just go for it. Other times, oh, students are, are often working in, in, the, in the world, um, and they realize Either they, A, want to advance their career in some way, and going to graduate school is often a good way to do that, or B, um, they want to pivot into the policy sector. So maybe they have four years of work experience, but it's in a totally different field, and they want to get into public policy, and, and thinking that a, a degree with us, for example, is a good way to do that. Um, so, so it really ranges. Um, if you all follow up with me afterwards as well, I'll just type my email in here. Um, I can share some, some resources. Um, we have some class profile information, graduation data as well. Um, I feel like I'm missing some of these questions. Uh, someone had a question about TOEFL scores higher than 100. Um, I think that can only give you a, a leg up. Um, that can only be a, an even stronger 
piece to your application, um, there is that minimum 100, but if you're above that, then that, that's a great sign. If there's anything else, um, you all can, can uh, unmute yourself. I might have missed it. But just for, I guess, for the last few minutes, I can talk about our different programs briefly, if that's OK. <laughs> um, so we, we do have um, a few different master's programs. The Master of Public Policy is, is our most popular and most flexible program. Um, the Master of International Development Policy, uh, this is more specialized than the Master of Public Policy or the MPP. This is all focused on international development. Uh, compared to the MPP, the, we, we use a lot of acronyms. So the MIDP, which is the Master of International Development Policy, is more of a cohort model, maybe only about 20 to 25 students in that, in that class every year. Um, the Master of Science, oh, that's an error there, Master of Science in Data Science for Public Policy, or DSPP, that's our newest program. Uh, it's, it's very technical, it's very structured as well. Um, and, and this program is at the intersection of data science and public policy. So a lot of programming, we use the languages of Python and R, um, but that's our newest program. We, we just had our first graduating class in May. And then the program that Andrea is part of is the Master of Policy Management, which is our mid-career professional program. Um, I, th I think for all of our programs, um, also we do have an executive program, which is for, for students who are much more advanced in their career. Um, there's a minimum seven year work experience requirement, but typically students will have about 14 or 15 years. Um, so very, very advanced in their career. Um, overall, our McCourt School programs are very quantitatively rigorous. Um, we really focus on driving evidence-based policymaking decisions. Um, and thus, we, we really like to train students with the necessary tools for, for them to be able to do that. Um, and let me just talk briefly about sort of the, the advantage of coming to McCourt. So our community, as, as Andrea talked about, uh, the, the students that we have, the, the opportunities for engagement both inside and outside of the, uh, outside of the classroom is very I, I think that's a selling point for us. We, our student organizations are all student run, student driven. They're doing uh, real world work. It's not just a social group. They do policy events. They bring in speakers from, from different world uh, policy er, areas of the policy universe, <laughs> I guess. Um, and, and generally, uh, they, they, I think our students are very public service oriented. We, we want to make the world a better place and they want to do these, they have ways of doing this in, in a tangible way. Um, some of our groups are working locally um, within, the, within DC. Others go, go abroad to some developing countries. We have one group called the Court Policy and Practice that actually goes to, in the past, Guatemala, the Dominican Republic, and works with an organization on the ground there um, to, to help out where, where they can. The curriculum, um, again, very interdisciplinary but quantitative in nature. Um, you can always email me for, for more specifics. I, I want to be aware of our time and, and kind of rush through the last few things. Um, there are tons of opportunities within DC inside and outside of the classroom. Our adjunct professors are, are professionals in the field. They come, you know, they're working during the day, coming to class at night. Um, I think our curriculum is grounded in, in reality, and it's not just all theoretical discussions. It's, it's real-world policy implications that, that are being discussed. Um, I think Georgetown uh, brings in world-class faculty, policy experts, politicians even. We have this institute called GU Politics that does a lot of really interesting work. Um, and of course, right now, given the election coming up, they're very busy and there's lots of really unique um, opportunities to engage uh, with, with politicians and some of their fellows. Um, our Career Services Office works specifically with McCourt students. You have access to them as a student and as an alumni for life. 
Um, they put on lots of networking events, they have workshops, they have a jobs and internships database. Um, too many things to mention, really. They're, they're always busy, but uh, it's really up to you to, to take advantage of, of all of the events and, and such that they have, um, but, but they offer a, a lot of resources and tools for you to really seek out and get that perfect internship or job. And finally, um, we have a very global alumni network, and, and I think our reputation is, is very strong, not just locally in DC, but you know, domestically within the US and, and abroad. And again, I thank you all for, for taking the time to, to join us today and learn more. Um, and I think that our alumni base is one of the strongest things about our program. Um, we have this page on, on our online called um, the McCord Ambassadors, um, and, and a lot of those are alumni who have graduated many years ago, but they're still happy to talk to students, happy to be engaged, um, and, and I think that's indicative of, of how they felt about their degree and, and how they, they feel about Georgetown. So lots of, lots of things to, to look forward to, um, and, and here are some, here's our website. Um, uh, and, and the uh, admissions inbox email as well. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back to you <laughs> to finish up. Um, um, Trish, I have one final question. Are there sure. any scholarship fellowship opportunities for international applicants? Yes, absolutely. Um, our our merit-based scholarships are available for domestic and international students. Um, to, to kind of reiterate, there's no separate um, scholarship application needed. For fall 2021 admissions, as long as you apply by December 1st or January 15th, those are our two early deadlines, you're guaranteed to be considered for our merit-based scholarships. Um, most of the time, they're partial tuition scholarships, but I think probably two thirds of our students get some kind of merit scholarship along with their offer of admission. Um, we do have five full tuition scholarships, but those are um, amongst all of our programs, and there is an interview process for, for <laughs> our McCourt scholars, um, and, and so they are very competitive. But most, most scholarships will be partial tuition scholarships, and then there's opportunities to work on campus as a research assistant, a graduate assistant. In, in the second year of your program, you can become a teaching assistant. Um, so those all can help with financing graduate school as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pessoal, alguém tem alguma pergunta final? Gostaria de perguntar alguma coisa? Não? Ok. So, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for coordinating this and thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope I got to most questions, but feel free to email me after afterwards um, and to connect with Andrea if, if you'd like. Um, we always love to hear from prospective students and, and to get more involved with, with some of our virtual events. So thank you very much, Trish and Andrea. It was amazing. Andrea, would you like to say <laughs> some you. words? It was really, really good. Just say thank you, and yes, if you need anything, let me know. I'm, I'm always up to answer some questions if I can. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so and, much. Um, uh, this session will be it's being recorded and will be downloaded in our uh, YouTube channel, and I'll send it to you guys. And I'm going to finish in Portuguese. Uh, pessoal, muito obrigada pela presença de vocês, muito obrigada pelas perguntas, muito obrigada pela pontualidade. Espero que tenha sido útil para todo mundo. Gostaria de lembrar que estudar nos Estados Unidos continua sendo muito mais fácil do que você imagina. Precisando de alguma coisa, por favor, continue consultando a nossa agenda de eventos. Agradeço demais a Trish e a Andrea e espero que tenha sido muito útil. Muito obrigada e tenham todos uma ótima tarde. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day, everyone. Good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.